Protect your brand, product, or invention from the hazards of consumer product launching and go from idea to product to big brand with guidance from retail product design and development experts Tracy and Tom Hazard. Get the insider secrets to put the right things in the right order with the right resources so you can out-design, outsource, and out-profit your way to retail success. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Product Launch Hazards. I know we haven't done an episode in a while, but this one needed to happen. It's about time. It's about time someone went and tackled furniture from a female perspective. So, and I know this better than anyone because I've spent a lifetime being the only woman in the room, a career being the only woman in a room trying to convince uh, buyers and other people that women actually care about the desks that they buy. They care about the chairs that they buy and they want features that no one's ever thought of before. And someone finally said, enough is enough. And she has decided to tackle on, tackle the desk industry and develop the her desk. So I've got Dana, Dana Backich. She's an entrepreneur, a digital strategist, a passionate, conscious consumer. And she founded her first p- business, Positive Equation, in 2017 with a focus on helping nonprofit marketers cultivate passionate online audiences of donors, partners, and advocates through social media. And her second di- business right now, her desk, is a responsibly made desk designed by and for women. It's not only designed by, you're going to hear it's made by it's uh, going to be marketed by. It's like there's everything about it. Um, they, the graphics, the website, all of it is done by women. Her desire is to provide women with a functional and beautiful space to work from home, which is so timely as well. I am really excited to bring Dana to you today because it, this is a topic of thinking about tackling an industry that is complex, that has uh, more sophisticated um, systems, like delivery systems are more complex because the product's bigger in furniture, the weight is heavier, the materials are harder to source in certain regions of the country. And so like she's taken all of that on. And so I really want you to hear about the genesis of creating a business like this. And she's very early on into it. She's still doing a crowdfunding round. Um, things are going very successfully and she does have funding to build the desk. So she's already in build. So they're going to be starting to ship, I think, pretty soon. So, you know, there's a lot of things that she's had to bring together and a lot of complications she's brought into developing this business and this product line. And I think she's handled it with a very um, core sensibility about what's important. And that's what I want you to hear from Dana today. So let's talk to Dana Backich about her desk. Hey, Dana, thank you so much for joining me today. So excited to talk furniture. Yes, thank you, Tracy. Happy to be here. Especially furniture designed by women. Do you know how rare that is? Very rare. (laughs) Very rare because I thought I was one of like 100,000. Yeah, trust me, for somebody who was Google searching it to try and find a piece of furniture to purchase from a female-owned business or just designed by a woman was very difficult to find. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the genesis of your concept and your idea. So what was going on? Totally. So, I mean, like, I feel like a lot of this, this was pre-COVID. Um, I had recently, I was actually a digital producer on American Idol Um, And so for nine months, I was working on a set and then I came back and I was doing, I was running my own business, doing digital consulting. And I just realized I needed a better desk. It was, it was that simple. And so um, I really respect conscious um, products of how they're built. And then also as a female entrepreneur, I wanted to ideally purchase a desk from a female owned business. And those like two things really, it was, I couldn't find any good features I couldn't find a desk from a female owned business on Google. I was searching everywhere. And so I ended up buying a desk off Wayfair, as a lot of us do, go to Target, Overstock, whatever. And I spent about $450, $500 on this desk. And it came in like 14 different pieces. It was made (laughs) out of particle board. It had that stamp of like made in Vietnam. And it came broken in two places. So And it took me about two hours to put together. So I was frustrated. That's actually really low. I'm just going to tell you that from having designed ready to assemble furniture for 25 years, that two hours is like nothing compared to some of the the products out there. (laughs) It was a night. It was a nightmare. And all I felt was like frustrated after putting it together. And the only thing I could think of was there has to be 
there has to be a better solution. And that was literally the genesis to thinking about once I sat at the desk, if you really think about it, the majority of desks are very A, masculine, and B, there's no real functionality besides a top, (laughs) right? There might be some (laughs) drawers, but most of the time, like some of them are standing now, but most of them, that's about it. You have a top to set stuff on. So I just started thinking about all the pain points and things that I use on a daily basis And I just, I reached out to a girlfriend of mine who was my college roommate, who's now an interior designer. And I was like, Hey, I have this idea um, that originally was just going to be for myself. And then it kind of evolves from there. (laughs) Well, you know, this is the interesting thing. So we think about this, but are your needs as a woman really all that different from a man's needs today? Because the design of a desk is based on an old world way of working. It actually has nothing to do with gender, except that there were just all men in the workplace at the time. So the size is outsized. So this is what I discovered when we were designing office chairs, for instance, that office chairs were designed for the average of a six foot male. Mm Mm-hmm. Very true. How many women have reached six feet, right? (laughs) Like it's not even close to the average size for a woman. So it was easy to make a change from a functionality standpoint and then from a design standpoint when you realize that the metric of how everything was designed, it was built off a bad premise, right? Right. So, but today I think we're built off a bad premise, not just of gender, the fact that the gender dynamics has changed, but the dynamics of how we work has changed. A hundred percent. I mean, even more so now in the past, what, six months, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, definitely changed. <laughs> slightly, slightly. So it's even become more apparent into even all the different tools and technology and accessories and things that we utilize in our home office spaces, or even if you're in a co-working space, right? That's something new since we work started that's come into like fruition for people um, outside of just a traditional office space. So yeah, you're right. Technic- technically, all of the features of her desk could also be used by a man. There's no reason that it couldn't be. Right, right. It's just a different work style that they maybe didn't realize it could be so great, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we used to call this covertly feminine design, right? This is actually a design process that my husband and I espouse because we couldn't tell the retailers, and I'm going to ask you about your research in just a moment, but we couldn't tell the researchers that we designed it for women even though Mm. women buy or influence 80% or Mm -hmm. more of the purchases in the marketplace, because if we did that, they would never put the product in. They would consider it to be too niche. So we wouldn't tell them. So the features were covertly feminine, but the, uh, but the product was just, just a desk at the end of the day or just a chair. Right. And that's how we would, we would get it in, but we knew between us we knew yeah. and the results were women loved it and men loved it even more than they thought they would right there you go so That's exactly you get, right. yeah so they didn't know it could be so good so anyway tell me a bit about your research so you now get this idea that you want to design a desk you want to go into an industry that's really a difficult industry to enter. And I'm just, most people don't understand. There's just lots of really close product lines out there. We've had discussions on the show about um, beauty products, which have a lot of chemicals. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't have a chemistry background, those are difficult products, but furniture has a supply chain problem, has delivery issues. It's one of the largest pieces of things you have to deliver. So it falls outside the realm of, there's like a whole can of worms. You probably had no idea you were going to get into. So how'd you do your research? Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, The first thing I did was A, I was looking at fast furniture and understanding the industry of that. I talked to a few different interior designers throughout the country. um, And I asked them their perspective, even on price on where their customers go. Um, I created a survey on Typeform and I sent it out asking, it was asking friends of mine and I I used to live in Los Angeles. And so I was a part of a bunch of different kind of like female entrepreneur communities. And I sent, I sent out my survey that was asking about features, about price, about where they shop for desks, about how often they buy desks, about um, would it matter if there was like a social component to it? Would it matter? I just, a list of questions. And I got back great responses from everyone for that. And from there, I, I continued to just kind of ask the marketplace. And I started to do a lot of research in <laughs> trying to find 
female-owned manufacturing facilities. No, I'm laughing because it's like, do you even know where you could find the manufacturing facilities? Because that's even just as hard. <laughs> it was super hard. I, I honestly went to Instagram and I was searching hashtags like um, women woodworkers or and trying to dive into that very niche community of like female carpenters and ask them. And they didn't even know of like <laughs> big female manufacturers. And then I reached out to a few I started searching by like family owned. I was just trying to get more and more where I wanted to be. And um, honestly, it wasn't until um, I found one female woodworker in Atlanta. Her, um, her handle is Wooden Maven. Her name's Char. And she's like, you know who you should talk to? This woman, April Wilkerson. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Because I wasn't in this space, right? And um, apparently April has a million YouTube subscribers and she's very well known on Instagram. She's an influencer there in the space. And ironically, super, super fortunate. She had just purchased a manufacturing facility in March where she has like three, three of her own CNC machines for the purpose of creating custom products. And she's in Texas. So on a whim, on a whim, I DM'd her on Instagram. I thought, I thought there's no chance that this girl is going to get back to me. And she messaged me right back. And we got into conversation. And I flew to Texas. I saw her shop. And the nicest human being and the nicest team. Um, but it was really, really difficult. There, were, there was months. I almost, I almost didn't make the product. Um, at the beginning, actually at the beginning of when COVID happened, A, just because I thought the market was going to be off um, with COVID happening, not understanding that, of course, everyone's going to work. It was going to be up. So, yeah. yeah. So they need a desk. I started So seeing, for those of you who have not yeah. been out shopping for furniture right now, there is a shortage. And so it happens for three reasons. cheap. Of fast furniture, right? Yeah, there's a yes. shortage of fast furniture. So for three reasons. One, COVID in China, where most of the furniture comes from, happened right after Chinese New Year. So as China, so they didn't come back from Chinese New Year. So they ship all the products, which mainly get sold out through the holidays and, and throughout January. And then there's a shortage always. There's like a downtime, but there's also a dip in orders from February through till April, till spring starts again is when orders normally pick up in the furniture market. So they thought, oh, we're going to be fine. But they never came back in February. So when you never come back, you don't build up inventory stores, you don't ship them, they don't get on the water. Right. And by April, there were no products in the marketplace because they burned through the inventory that had been on a retail shelf, but maybe shifted into digital and sold digitally. So they were all gone. And then they didn't place as many orders because all the buyers panicked. So now we have a shortage of orders for back to school, which wasn't going to happen. So we normally have small chairs, smaller desks, which those are the things that most people would want to buy for their homes, right? Slightly smaller right. footprints, all not, not ordered um, and not in stock. So we fast forward all the way to the fall and you can barely get anything in stock right now. Right. And meanwhile, the demand has skyrocketed. That's so right. Way off I'm the a, charts. I'm a digital marketer first and foremost. And so the first thing I did, I go to Google Trends. And I start looking at what's happening in the press. And if you, the search term desks just over the past 12 months is like this. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so it's like, doo, 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 and then it like skyrockets up. So it's a hundred percent what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so this is the, the issue. So there's no place to buy in store. There's no place to buy online and the shipping's always extended on large, heavy furniture. Um, beds are the same problem right now. If you want to buy a brand new bed, you can forget it right now. It's out of stock everywhere. Um, extended deliveries. And when it comes, it will be broken. I, mean, I guarantee it. <laughs> um, and so I've been through three of them. So <laughs> I can say that oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Three deliveries are all broken. So, um, so you, you just, you come to this place where it's an actual, a nightmare of, of supply, a nightmare of delivery systems that are really broken and not able to. So how, how do you look at that from a marketer and say, I'm going to do this in a different way? And what am I going to do? So I love that question. So the first thing I did was, A, I flew to Texas, right? <laughs> I wanted to see everything. I wanted to understand what's the product. I need to, I'm a 
I'm a very visual learner. And so I didn't want anything to be shipped to anybody without A, me seeing it first. I wanted to test it. I changed things when I went down there. Um, when we were talking about height, I changed where I wanted specific things. Um, I changed once I saw the desks, I wanted to make sure the drawers were full extension and had a soft close. So things that aren't normal on a desk, but more normal on like your cabinets right in your kitchen, but make, but make a big difference. And then from a shipping perspective, the desk currently has three different colors and that you can choose from and different handle colors. So I'm having each of the three desks shipped to me separately because I want to QA that process. I want to see, is there a problem? Which A, how long does it take to get to me from Texas to Atlanta? Um, and then B, are there any components that with these three different shipments, is there anything broken? Is there anything damaged? So I am the one receiving an issue and not a consumer receiving an issue. So th this is the thing about furniture. Furniture is heavy. Mm -hmm. So when you ship something heavy, things happen in shipping. It's not just like UPS is dangerous and like they throw stuff around. It's not that at all. This thing is weighted. And so in its own weight, things can crush, things can get bumped, things can. So you don't actually realize that until you do ship one. So I love that you follow that process of like, let's really QA this. So let's, let's make sure that we can quality assure it for the future. So we're not just going to do quality control. We're going to check it and we're going to improve it for the next time. And we're going to improve it every time we yep. move forward. That's a great process, Dana. That was one of our main conversations when I was down there was around how do we want to make sure I'm also trying to be as sustainable as possible, which is tricky when you're trying to make sure that you have padding and it's being created. Like, is it foam that like molds to it, right? Where you put it in, or is it something that's like when you're moving in those boxes, you know, you have those little corners that go on your television. If you're going to move it, like what are the pieces? That... It create, it create kind of, kind of crate. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So like what will be what's the most sustainable idea and um, minimal, but will still give the best result at the end of the day is kind of where my brain goes. And so what I love about the team is even when I was down there, we're actively troubleshooting and discussing options. So they might even ship one desk one way and another desk another way. And we can see, is there any difference? Do they both work? Does one work better than the other? Um, yeah, because this is the thing. So how you pack a box matters. And this is you you think that, oh, logically, I'm going to pack it um, from the biggest pieces to the smallest pieces like that just seems like a logical way. But what happens is, is then when somebody tilts it up on their truck, you created an imbalance. And it leans right. and, it, and so then shifts. they, yeah, it shifts. And so then they store it the wrong way because it keeps falling over. And so that now they're not following your recommendation of which end is up, right? And so this is where stuff goes wrong. Like you, you, our logic doesn't always work in the actual process of how something gets delivered. So good, yes, good for 100%. you to keep testing. I love that. Always, now, always. What about scaling? Because this is a pretty small manufacturing facility and it's the startup manufacturing facility. So there's a lot of risk there. I mean, you know, what about scaling? Are you going to be able to handle that? So that was one of the questions that I also asked April and her team and her, her answer was, she's like, if you, if you're bringing in too many orders that I can't handle, I'm going to get another CNC machine and I'm going to hire more staff. The, the dream world to me is a facility where there are women hired in building these desks. There are very few women in the construction space, in the woodworking space, carpenters. So if I can employ, like right now, the person who built my website, my publicist, marketing, the branding, every single person has been a woman that's been hired. So I'm trying to be authentic and true in the process. So scalability, I would say, I would honestly, right now, stick, April is an expert in what she does in understanding woodworking and building materials. And so with her leadership, I would say, let's work on hiring women in Texas. Or if we notice that there are, that New York is a hot spot for her desk. Maybe we say, okay, let's invest in getting a space there and being in building the desk there, or if it's in California, figuring out where is the demand for the desk. If it is, if it happens to be regionally and being smart, because therefore like you mentioned with shipping, I include shipping in my price 
and shipping is very expensive for for a 60 pound, 48 inch item. Um, So if there is a way to make the shipping more cost effective um, and create facilities that are closer, that would be amazing. Well, so here's here. I'm going to give you a tip here. So there's a couple of people I can introduce you to, but the shipping, putting your facility as close to your shipping ideal location actually matters with furniture. So uh, there's a couple companies that I worked with over the years and they created five different warehouses and five facilities near those warehouses because Mm -hmm. the shipping made it more efficient to get it out to every single region within the country, which allowed them to be almost prime or prime certified for Amazon in that particular case, which was one of their goals. So not every product can hit that because if you have a large oversized, it does have to still be trucked like a a right. cow king bed has to be trucked. There's no way about it. But you, you know, 48 inches and under, and you can certainly do that. And so they found that there were five ideal locations that would allow you to get to every single region in the country. But these things you wouldn't know. It's not your standard ones. Like if you did research and said, okay, where do coffee suppliers do that? Like it's not the same. And it has to do with the size of product and the shipping facilities and the, the types of runways at the airport that's there. It's a very unusual uh, ask. Um, of people to find and research and match something and say, I'm going to be able to model this. So you took on something that's hugely difficult to model. And, um, and so that's the next question I have for you. So you're a marketer first and you have marketing models that work, you know, go to Kickstarter, go to Indiegogo, do these things. Have they been working for furniture in the way that you expected in the way that they work for other products? So it's really interesting. So my background is in really the nonprofit space. So in fundraising. Um, And so this e-commerce space is very new for me, but I've been utilizing the traditional models that I know. So I did do a crowdfunding campaign on iFundWomen that's been predominantly family and friends um, backed. But then through that, which is interesting is those campaigns just open you up before you're selling a product for market right, for marketing opportunities. So through that, I was able to get a speaking gig with Create and Cultivate, which is an organization with a ton of female entrepreneurs. And I was speaking on how to create a business during COVID. So it enabled me to be able to have that opportunity. Um, It's also opened the door where I've received interesting requests for angel, from angel investors in the business. Right now, I want 100% equity of the company, but it's good to at least have those inquiries coming my way, which shows there's an interest in the product. Um, and then the other, rev- the other angles I've gone have been through social media advertising, which I know really well um, through digital marketing. So Facebook, Instagram, and what was amazing about those is when I was trying to just gain an email list, when I had a wait list, I was able to have an email lead for less than 15 cents per wow. person. It was because incredible. it's a hot topic, number one, because yes. you understood how you're reaching them and who you're reaching and you were dialed into your target market. So I'm assuming that those three things kind of came together for you. Yes. And it was really interesting. I did a lot of work on the target audiences and I went from the female entrepreneur space, which I know well, and the people that they look to. I also went the media outlet way because I know it's a hot topic in the media and actually got sales from that demographic as well, which was interesting. (laughs) Because we're all working from home, right? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, And then I've gone the other route, right? Which is the very typical, I'm searching for a furniture, I'm searching for desk, home office. So entrepreneur, media driven, and then straight like IKEA, Target, product driven. Yeah. So um, right now I'm still running all of those. So it's a learning phase. And then the other one that's driving a ton of website traffic right now, Google ads, searching for desks and Pinterest Mm -hmm. because women go to Pinterest is more of a search engine versus a social network. So they go there for ideas, right? About interior design or home office spaces. And so I've been running targeted pins around those different keywords and that's driven a ton of new traffic. So yeah, the, the channels are working. I think I'm only at this point a week in. <laughs> so I'm, I'm running the ads and I'm seeing what works and doing a bunch of A-B testing and then spending more money into obviously the ones that are proving results. 
So what's next? What, what challenge do you have to fix now? <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's, it's brand awareness. Mm. It, that's the largest chunk. So it's going to be, I'm working a lot on finding the right collaborations and partners um, to try and do this as organic as possible without a ton of paid. Um, but it's a lot of work to make the dent into becoming, essentially having a share of voice. So I need to make sure that I'm thought of when Ikea is thought of, right? Or when Target is thought of or Wayfair is thought of. Is how do I find, and I don't need, I don't want everyone, right? I am looking for a very specific consumer that is a woman who wants to feel empowered but they sit down at a desk and believes that it's more than just a piece of furniture but this is a piece that somebody's put a lot of love into and I feel positive energy here and I feel creative here um, and it has all the functionality that I want plus they have a little bit more of a disposable income because it's in that like $800 range so it's not it's not I was looking at a lot of competitors it's not over a thousand dollars but the fast furniture space is really in that $500 and less. And I didn't want to be there. So it's finding like that niche target demographic that I'm looking for. Well, you know, that's, that's pretty challenging as to, to put your name up there against someone who's, who's a probably half the price point of where you are. So that, and the problem for you is that there isn't competitors at that higher end. Like there isn't anyone doing what you're doing in that space at a higher end, making it work and that you're coming in kind of in that midpoint. You're not. So you have this very odd place of trying to find your brand, your brand voice amid someone who's never considered that this is value. Yeah. You know, the marketplace the audience, hasn't, the audience has, but the, but the brands and the marketing hasn't been, hasn't appeared before. Right. I would say the two that I look to a lot are Joybird. I mm-hmm. look to a lot. Um, I have a Joybird. It's actually the love seat that's sitting right there. <laughs> um, Burrow, Burrow with their couches, also like New York made, Joy, or Joybird is California made, the sustainable, you get to customize, right? Your fabrics and your, um, chair legs. So those are two brands that I kind of look to that are in that above a thousand dollar range and their desks. Joybird has desks that are 800 and above. So it's going for essentially like me, I'm, I'm willing to, I'm 31 and I'm willing to spend a little bit more for something that's made well and has a social purpose behind it. Yeah. You know, this is, it, we're getting to a place where people are starting to get a, a sense of the devastation of fast furniture. Um, there's a great documentary on um, uh, Netflix right now called Broken. It's a series. And the first one on cosmetics will scare the crap out of you. Um, Ooh, you'll I'm never be able to buy down. another product. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll never be able to buy another product without like scrutinizing every single piece of the packaging, wondering if it's a counterfeit cosmetic or not. Anyway. Yeah. So you can't buy online without like worrying about this, but this, I think it's the third one, the second or third one that is on furniture. And it talks about sort of the problem of for deforestation and a whole bunch of things that are coming in and, and sort of the rise of Ikea, which, you know, inarguably is um, also a, uh, there, there's all kinds of banking and fraud and, and laws that they're, they're, that they're being investigated under and have been for decades. Um, uh, you know, international banking rules that they are violating. So, in, you know, in addition to all kinds of sustainability issues that they claim they don't have, but they do. And then, of course, the really scary part is kids dying because their products are collapsing on top of them. Mm-hmm. I have seen those, yeah. Yeah, and so this is what this whole, it's called Broken, and what this whole series is about in this particular episode is about fast furniture. But what, what when I, as I was watching that coming from the furniture industry and understanding what's happened here, is I think they missed the big mark here. And what they missed is, is that that love and care that you were talking about, that you put into the design of your furniture, that you put it into it, has completely disappeared over the 25 years that I've been working in the industry. When I first started, there were designers. There were people who were spending time thinking about the ergonomic needs of their consumer base, thinking about how things were being sold, how things were being shipped. We were considering all of that. And the majority of furniture was built in North Carolina. 
That's right. It was built in North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, Virginia is another really good place. They talk about that. They talk about Bassett um, as being a big word, wood fit manufacturer. Um, but there are also other places that have different types of woods around the country and around the world where they were making. So it was very diverse in terms of where you could buy furniture from. And I worked out of the furniture industry in Michigan. So I got to work on air on chairs and, and contract furniture out of Herman Miller, which was very sustainably focused as well. But we were building furniture for a lifetime. We weren't building mm -hmm. fast furniture. And there's one thing about making something easy to assemble because we want to lower our, our ability, uh, our package size. We want to make it easier for people to buy products and receive them in their home and put them together. That didn't mean we had to go and make something that didn't last a lifetime. And that's the right. mistake that happened somewhere in that process. They decided, well, if the consumer puts it together, then we don't have to care about it lasting. Where did that mindset come from? Like, you know, when did that happen? Because I don't think that that was what any, any designer would have been on the outset. We were always concerned with, you know, cradle to grave and what was going to happen to products. But what happened over time is as the sourcing moved overseas, and we did that. We went overseas. We worked with factories. We did that for 15 years and helped transition lots of products and lots of companies to being able to do that. But we were involved in the process along the way. And over time, what happened is, Office Max would go direct and Target mm -hmm. would go direct and Wayfair would pop out. And all they did was buy furniture designed by a factory. So there was no care, no love. And what I call styling happened. And that's where you may get an interior designer or a stylist at the company who goes, yeah, we want it in blue. We want it in, bl right. in black. We want it in espresso. But that's about the extent of what they did. And they said, we want three drawers instead of two. Like it was just that kind of thing. It wasn't a real care at, wow, how does this work with the way that people are working today? There was no industrial or product design happening anymore. And we recognize that, which is why we, we moved out of the industry at a time at which we moved into other things. And that's why I have a podcast business now instead of a design business. But, you know, I mean, I, my products are still selling on the market. So I still keep in touch. I know how things are working. But this is where it's disappeared. And so you're bringing back full circle, Dana. You're bringing back love and design into the process. And you're bringing back consideration for the entire cycle of the product, like how it gets shipped, who's making it, where it's made from, what materials go into it. And you know what? It's time again. I think that, that you're, right, you're about to start riding a wave of that consideration happening on products all over the place because we cannot continue to make wood products and deforest in the way that we have. It's just not possible. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think people are caring more, especially Gen Z and the younger generations that are coming up care more about what they're buying, where they're buying it from, how the materials are created. I know I watch, speaking of documentaries, I watched one on Netflix as well that was on fast fashion. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what was it That's called? why I never worked in fashion because it scared me because it was of how disposable it was. Oh, I'm going to like hate that I don't remember. My fair something? Anyways, um, essentially it, again, scared me so much about what I was wearing yeah. and how it was treated that I now read the tags on my clothing like I do my food. There you go. It's she, It's time. Things are changing. We're starting to pay attention to that. But, you know, this is the thing. It, when, when you start to take on a, a company like this, though, and you start to take on a task that is really big and broad, how do you surround yourself with people, research, advice? What do you do to make sure that this isn't all on you? Because this is where a lot of fails. I reach out to people who are smarter than me in different elements and use their expertise. All I'm doing is going out and I think I have been so fortunate with finding people like Char who make the recommendation for someone like April, April who says yes, which makes a recommendation for this person who makes, you know what I mean? It's just like, and April said it and Char said it. when you find somebody who, if there's a good concept, who's a good person, you want them to succeed. And everyone's willing to open those doors to make those relationships happen or else I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. So I think that's it. I feel like if you're a good person and you're trying to do something good, people want to help. And it's just finding the right people who are skilled at what they do and saying, yes, I want you to help with this. Yes, I need you to help with this. And, and bringing them into those conversations when you need their help. Are you already starting to hear ideas for your next product? Oh, man. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> You're getting requests already, aren't you? <laughs> well, April wants, we want to build a chair. We want to build different styles of desks. We, yeah, there's, there's plenty of ideas out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to put in a request for kids' desks because I don't believe that our virtual classroom will go away. It's not just because of COVID. I don't believe that. I think that once you go virtual, there's going to be a significant amount of students that stay virtual for at least a segment of their education. I think our high school yeah. students, our junior high school students are going to stay virtual um, because it's more efficient, um, cost efficient for the school systems that are running out of budget. Um, the students are responding well to it. So I think that at the end, we're going to need some student sized desking. <laughs> so there you go. Too. Yeah, yeah exactly. let's add that one to the list. So, <laughs> but um, chairs are 25 years doing chairs. This is a challenge. Chairs are the yes. biggest. So they're the biggest liability out of all furniture pieces. That is the, so, you know, you're now taking on something even more scary. <laughs> bring it. I mean, bring it on. I bring think, it you know, on. Honestly, I got it. <laughs> one of the best quotes, and I'm going to mess it up, but it's from Sarah Blakely. And it's about having, when you're naive, you don't have the, you're not afraid to mess anything up because you don't know. So you go at it trying, and then you figure it out as you go versus if you go into it with the fear, you're never going to attempt it in the first place. That's right. Well, good for you, Dana. So now tell us, how your Kickstarter went because how your Kickstarter, it's a, not quite closed as we're recording this, but it should be closed by the time we're done. How did it go for you? There's, I just looked at it earlier. I think there's 23 funders and I'm at almost 3K and my goal is 10K and I have 10 days left. So honestly, what I need to do is I'm not, it's the hardest part to ask people for money. So I need to be diligent about making my very strategic asks to fund the rest of it. Um, to me, if I could get like to eight, 7,500 AK, that would be success for me. Well, you know, here's the thing. You haven't asked Kickstarter yet. They're notorious for being bad for women owned pro women products in general. So I have, I've done, I did a whole study and I did an article about it, I don't know, a couple of years ago about a razor that came out for, it was tweezers, like a, a, I'm sorry, eyelash curler and a razor that came out at the same exact moment. And the razor was just nothing special. It just had this like sustainably wooded, wood handle and like, you know, it was luxury and it overfunded the um, eyelash curler, which was really cool, 3D printed to fit your eye, like it had all kinds of really cool things to it, didn't fund by wow. yeah, at all, like significant difference. And it is because the funding base, the base that makes a Kickstarter kick off and get noticed and then picked up by the Kickstarter organization and giving that boost is all male. So if you can't get to that male audience first, you will mm. never get the boost. And they're very criticized under it. So I'd uh, put a little kick in there and for this last one to say, hey, you know, this is just yet another example of why your base is all male and not working. Interesting. Well, that's a reason I went with. So the platform that I'm fundraising on is I fund women. So they are all funded by women and they reinvest the percentage, um, the fees that you pay on your end, they reinvest into grants for the female owned business on, on their site. Nice. Um, yeah. So it's a really unique platform and they do mentoring and coaching to help you succeed. So that's even like, I have a direct contact with somebody to ask them about, are there more things I should be doing? Do you have recommendations? Are there grants available? So I purposely went with them instead of like an Indiegogo and actually a lot of other crowdfunding platforms, they won't give you the payout until a the very end or b if you don't raise your goal then you don't get any you of it you don't get any of it right exactly so i fund women i've been getting payments weekly that's which nice is amazing because that way i can continue to grow and scale my business without waiting for 27 days to go by mm, wonderful well good so yeah go out reach ask it doesn't hurt be that voice of contrast because it is a big contrast what you're doing to what exists in the marketplace. Thank you. And that's, you got to live in that differentiation because right. people are out there looking for it. So this is the last thing that I want to say to all of you out there listening to this and to, to Dana, especially I want her to hear is that women are, are not loyal consumers. That's a mistake. 
they are not loyal to one product. They're not loyal to a brand that doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for at least the last 20 years. They are loyal to what they want to someone who solves their problem. They are constantly on the hunt and constantly looking for the right thing. And when they find it, they will find money to pay for it because they've been looking for it. They may have bought disposable things along the way because they had to fill a need, but they bought it. I call it buying under duress. You buy something because you have to have something to fill this spot, but you're, so you'll spend as little as possible to do that. But that still doesn't mean you're not out there looking for just the right thing. And when the right thing shows up, you will buy it because you don't want to miss out on it. So, Dana, I think you've got the right product at the right time. And I wish you luck in making sure that the market gets it and hears it and sees it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I told you that was going to be really complex and interesting to think about all these working features and functions. And, you know, so often we can get into mistakes um, and into dangerous territory that derails us and we don't solve ourselves out of. Reaching out to the people that she's working with, the collaborators that she's in and solving those problems is exactly the way she should be doing that. Um, by saying, gosh, okay, I now have a a problem of how do we package this and how do we ship this? And she's working in concert with her manufacturing facility, shipping it to herself, checking this out, really staying involved in that process. And so one of the things that I found in my career of product design and development is that we were more successful if I stayed involved from the ideation stage all the way through to the first run, first ship, and into probably them starting the second run. When we did that in the process, the product improved tremendously all along the way. But more importantly, the decisions that get made along the way don't derail the big vision for the product. And that's where Dana's involvement is essential. And some people will criticize and say, wow, you know, she's heading a company, she's the CEO, she should step back and let other people do this. This is her vision. This is her expertise in, in, and her differentiator in the market. So her staying involved in making sure that this happens and it achieves that vision is essential to putting that love that she keeps talking about into her product and into the line. And at the end of the day, this is building great brand value for herself, for how the market's going to perceive that, for the consumers that receive it, that love it, and then rave about that. And our ultimate goal, like this actually used to be our tagline when we had our business before. So Has Design's tagline was that we wanted to get products that were bought and used again and again and raved about. That if we did that, if we designed that, then we succeeded. So the used again and again was our our way of saying sustainability. But the fact that people love them and raved about them, that just was that tipping point of saying that this isn't just something I bought and I used it and I'm happy with it. I loved it so much. I had to tell everybody how great my experience was with it. And that experience extends beyond the product into how it's received, the fact that it's not broken, the fact that it's easy to assemble at the end of the day and doesn't take you an excruciating amount of hours to put together. Um, You know, this is all a part of the process. And I love that Dana has just said, I'm going to reinvent and look at this from a new perspective, from this naive viewpoint, but actually from a concerted viewpoint about a very specific specific a goal that I'm trying to achieve. So as long as those things are in place, having a naive viewpoint doesn't matter because you have a goal of what you want to fix and how you want to fix that. Wow. I'm really excited for Dana. I'm really excited to see how this goes. I'm also really um, interested to see product line expansion and other things happen because that's where businesses have a lot of hiccups. As you go from that first flagship product into more, it gets harder and harder to sustain principles and do things. So I look forward to following her journey and see how she does this because I have a feeling she's not going to let go of those principles too easily. So I wish Dana luck and check out her desk. Uh, There's images, there's going to be links to everything. All of that is at the website, um, uh, productlaunchhazards.com. You can also go to hasdesign.com and you'll be able to find blog posts for this episode and all the links out to her desk and to Dana Backage. So thank you everyone for listening. I'll be back next time. I find a really cool and interesting product story to bring you. And if you have a great product story you'd like to share with me, you know how to find me. You can find me at Has Design on social media and that's Has with two Zs. So again, thanks everyone for listening. I'm Tracy Hazard on Product Launch Hazards. 
Thank you for joining us on this episode of Product Launch Hazards. To get the most out of your membership, visit productlaunchhazards.com to join the expert office hours live and ask us your burning questions. Check out the resource library for document templates and guides and get exclusive articles and shares each day. Don't forget, you can always book a private consult with any expert so you can outdesign, outsource, and outprofit your way to product launch success. 